They call him the Little Giant. He's Weeb Bank coach of the New York Jets, and he's seen a lot happen in his pro football career. Last week, he came back to Baltimore to face Don McCafferty's Colts, and any time the two teams meet, Eubank's role comes to mind. He's the man who coached the Colts and Johnny Unitas through their glory years, then went to New York and brought Joe Namath to the Jets and defeated his old team in the first AFL Super Bowl victory, a key factor in bringing about a merger of the two leagues. Since then, the Colts have remained strong, while Eubank's Jets have been up and down. But any time the two teams meet, the greatest interest has to be the anticipated duel of two pairs of shoes and the men who fill them. Johnny Unitas and Joe Namath have never really gone head-to-head -head for a whole game. In the Super Bowl, Unitas didn't play until the end. And since then, it is said, he has been on the decline. The Colts and Jets have played four times since then. The Colts have won all of them, but Joe Namath missed three of those games. In the fourth, he broke his hand before the game was over. And so last week, Namath was healthy and ready to try his golden hand once again at defeating the man he idolized as a kid. The man who was voted the greatest quarterback of the century, who plays for a team with the best pass defense in the league. Wherever Namath goes, his followers come to watch and enjoy the proceedings. Last week, they should have brought champagne. This is the NFL game of the week, the New York Jets versus the Baltimore Colts. In the first quarter, both teams would score only once. Namath tried to run John Riggins early, but he knew he'd have to pass because the Colts' defense is practically invincible against the run. Even his first pass was off, one of the few he would throw to Don Maynard, one of the few he would not complete. The Colts have a strong pass rush, even without the injured Bubba Smith. And on third down, they almost caused a turnover. But Namath's arm went forward, and it was ruled an incompletion. So the Jets' first series went nowhere. On his second series, however, Namath began his incredible day. His plan was not only to pass, but to pass medium to long. His first completion was significant, because the man who caught it was Ed Bell the Jets' five-foot, nine-inch wide receiver, who some thought was too small to make it. Three plays later, behind perfect protection from number 75, Winston Hill, and the rest of the line, Namath went for Bell again deep, and the result was six points on a 65-yard touchdown. On a repeat of the play, watch Namath's pocket form on his quick drop back. The pass was perfect, allowing Bell to slow up and catch it while both Colt safeties, Rick Volk and Jerry Logan, slipped and Bell outraced Charlie Stoops to the end zone. It was unusual enough to see the Colts' deep zone beaten for a touchdown at all, let alone this early in the game. But it was only the beginning. The point after failed and the Jets led 6-0. The Colts' first quarter was rather similar. Unitas tried his short game early, some runs and short passes to his setbacks, but the Jets' defense was ready, and led by the return of number 81, Jerry Philbin, was defensing the Colts well early. With Philbin and John Elliott back, along with John Little and Mark Lomas, the Jets' front four is strong and would pressure Unitas for most of the game. On a repeat, watch the Jets' Philbin beat his man, Dennis Nelson, to Unitas for the sack. In a game where passing was so paramount, the line play often goes unnoticed, but is, of course, just as important as the pass and the catch. With Unitas still unsuccessful running Tom Matty and Don Nottingham, who was starting for the injured Norm Bulash, he, too, began passing more often. The Jets secondary figured to be their weakness with four young starters, none of whom had more than three years experience. But the Colts have inexperience at wide receiver. 
and rookie Cotton Spire, number 28, couldn't hold this one in bounds. So Unitas decided to use Tom Mitchell, his tight end, and Mitchell led a Colts drive downfield near the end of the quarter, dragging his smaller defender, Phil Wise, for a first down on the Jets' 40. Then came the equalizer, a play the Jets last saw in the Super Bowl. They didn't see it then, and they wouldn't see it now. The flea flicker, from Unitas to Matty, back to Unitas to Sam Haberlack would have backfired if Unitas hadn't made the best catch of his career. In the Super Bowl, Earl Morrill didn't see Jimmy Orr all alone and threw an interception that turned the game in the Jets' favor. This time it worked to perfection and the Colts took a 7-6 lead. Then on the last play of the quarter, the Colts would get a chance to increase the lead as Roy Hilton pinched in from the right for a rare sack of Namath. The Colts recovered, and the first quarter ended with Baltimore's defense looking as tough as ever. They had really given only one bomb on which two defenders slipped, and they now gave the Colts offense the ball on the Jets' 27. After the fumble, Unitas moved to the Jets' nine. But from here, a problem the Colts had on opening day, and one they would have in this game became evident. Unitas couldn't take the team into the end zone. Three plays failed, and they settled for a field goal and a 10-6 lead. The next time they had the ball, the same thing happened. Unitas to Mitchell took them between the 20s, as Mitchell, the man who forced John Mackey to be cut, often was open, getting between the cornerbacks and safeties. But again, the Jets' defense tightened up near the goal. Mark Lomas, number 84, got to Unitas on second down from the 18. And on third down, seeing Tom Matty covered, Unitas turned and went for Spirer. But sophomore Rich Sowles, number 46, saved a score. The Colts again settled for a Jim O'Brien field goal. But this was the second straight series. They came away with four points less than they could have, a fact which would be forgotten in the barrage of yardage that was to follow. The barrage started on the Jets' next series. Namath figured passing medium and long was his only chance, and here he went to Rich Castor, his tight end, who would loom even larger in the second half. On the play, the Jets' chances seemed to diminish, however, when center John Schmidt had to leave with an injury. Schmidt is perhaps the key man and most adept man in the line at protecting Namath, and the Jets have to use a backup guard to replace him. Schmidt's absence may have demoralized the rest of the line, for on the next play, we can see that Namath almost didn't get the pass off. But let's see what happened on the play. It's a testimony to how great Namath really is, although you never could tell from Namath's reaction to the event. On the play, Roy Hilton got his hand up in Namath's face, but Joe Willie fired a perfect 40-yard strike to set back Riggins, who easily beat Lonnie Hepburn to the goal, answering any doubts as to John Riggins' speed. The Jets had tied the score at 13. New York then kicked the ball into the end zone, but was penalized and Howfield had to kick again. It proved to be a 100-yard penalty, for Don McCauley took the gift kickoff all the way. Colley's speed, too, has been questioned, but this return seemed to answer that issue and put the Colts back on top, 20 to 13. Although the kicking game would be overshadowed by other facets, it continued to play a key role. And the band played on. The band played on for Joe Namath on the following series, as he again dared the Colts zone to stop him. And Eddie Bell once again was there, 40 yards downfield between defenders Logan and Bolt, two of the best in the game. But Logan and Bolt were up against the best in the game. And on the next play, again having all the time in the world, Namath found Don Maynard for his only catch of the game, a touchdown. On 
a repeat, we can see that linebacker Ray May was now trying to stop Eddie Bell at the line, fearing him the most. So this time Namath crossed them up by going for Maynard, who had slipped into the open area in front of the safeties, and Namath again hit his target perfectly in stride. Sunday stunned Mike Curtis and the Colts defense tried to figure out how to solve their problems. Unitas' offense lasted one play after the score. Sacked by Philbin, Lomas recovered for the Jets on the Colts' 10 in another key play by the defense, which would perhaps be forgotten. Namath hadn't thrown too many 10-yarders in this game, but this one, like the 40-yarders, also came quick and easy. Rich Castor screened out Logan and made the catch. In just three minutes, the game had seen four touchdowns. Namath had thrown 67, 28, and 10-yard scores in the span, giving him four for the half. Good for 281 net yards passing against a secondary that normally gives up three or four touchdown passes in a season. But John Unitas has seen a lot of games come and go, and he's the master of the two-minute drill, even at 39 years old. Sure enough, he led the Colts downfield with a couple of passes, a short one to Tom Maddy, and a beautiful bomb to Sam Havrilak, who easily beat early Thomas and went out on the Jets' four. But here again, the Colts faltered with time for two more plays and a chance to tie. First, a major penalty on this incompletion set them back to the 19. Then on the final play of the half, O'Brien shanked a 27-yarder, and the Colts went into the locker room down by seven. In as wild and wonderful a first half as perhaps ever seen, there were still 30 more minutes of a history-making showdown. This Bigfoot belongs to a big man. The Colts really could have used Bubba Smith today, for he excels on the pass rush, and his team would get to Namath only once all day. For almost the entire third quarter, both teams went nowhere, especially on the ground. Standout defensive plays, like this one by number 81, the Jets' lightning quick end, Jerry Philbin, reduced the running game to a shambles for both teams. This was to be a day for the forward pass, and Namath and the Jets returned to it with excellent results. Little Eddie Bell pulled in his seventh reception of the day on the Colts' 23. But two plays later, Bell and Maynard got mixed up on their pass patterns, and Namath's long bomb fell into a crowd of Colts. Jerry Logan came up with an interception to end the Jets' threat. On a day when footballs filled the air, Logan Steele was the only one of the day for either team. Baltimore was unable to generate any offense, and when the Jets took over, their series produced the only score in the entire third quarter. Namath began by going with the same long sideline pass to Bell that had been intercepted. This time, Lonnie Hepburn made a good defensive play. Namath turned to a new strategy. The two long tries to Bell had loosened the Colt defense enough to try the ground game again. And with Emerson Boozer out, Namath simply handed the ball to John Riggins. The 230-pound fullback from Kansas ran the ball three consecutive times for huge chunks of yardage through one of the game's greatest ground defenses. So successful was the ground game that when a snap from center was bobbled, Joe Namath made a few yards himself. But after that highly unlikely occurrence, Broadway Joe returned to John Riggins, who again carved out yardage against the proud Baltimore defense. In this one series, Riggins carried six times for 43 yards. Today, he gained 87 yards for the entire game to go with his 125-yard game in the season's opener.
Two plays later, New York was faced with a third down situation, and Riggins got the ball again. This time, the Colts made the big defensive play and stopped the Jets short of the first down. But the man who made it, Rick Bolt, paid the price of dealing head-on with John Riggins. The six-year safety from Michigan had made a great individual defensive play that had taken a knee in the head to go with it. But Volk only missed a few plays and was shortly back in the lineup. Bobby Howfield was called in for a 14-yard chip shot that increased New York's lead to 10 points, 30 to 20. The jet kickoff was the final play of the third quarter. It was taken deep in the end zone by rookie Bruce Laird, and the rookie from American International took the ball up the right sideline to his own 44. Now at the start of the fourth period, with excellent field position for the first time in the second half, Unitas turned to his heretofore non-existent running game again. This time it worked, as Norm Boulash watched helplessly from the sideline, incapacitated with a pulled thigh muscle, Nottingham and Matty nickled and dimed their way down the field to the New York one. Here, a third setback was added, and it was he, Don McCauley, who got the call for the touchdown. For all their third quarter inefficiency, the Colts were back in the ball game and trailed by just three points. But not for long, for New York's first play of the next series, Namath really let it fly. and Rich Castor had combined for a 74-yard pass play. A repeat shows Namath had to unload quickly, and Lonnie Hepburn just missed making the save. After that, it was all Rich Castor, as the big tight end went in for the score with Rick Bolt trailing him. With startling suddenness, the Jets had regained their 10-point lead. But there was still plenty of time for a Baltimore comeback, and come back they did. Unitas took to the air, but his first pass was batted down by John Elliott. Unitas then went to the other side and hit Cotton Spire at the sideline for first down. Spire was starting in place of Eddie Hinton, another of the Colts injured brigade today. Unitas stayed with the safe, short sideline passes as he expertly picked his spots and moved his team downfield. Then, on the Jet 22, he faked to Nottingham and lofted the ball in the flat to Matty. The grand old man had done it. The Colts were back in the game. A repeat shows how well Unitas' play fake worked. Number 80, John Elliott, a lineman, was the only man who didn't go for it, as Matty took the ball all alone and waltzed into the end zone. Number 19, Chris Parasopoulos, added some punctuation to the score. It was fitting that in this moment of glory, two old hometown heroes, Tom Matty and John Unitas, shared the spotlight as they had so many, many times in the past 12 years. But the moment of glory was again brief for Baltimore because again on first down, Broadway Joe Namath went for the bomb and got it. His slingshot found Rich Castor again and the 6-5 converted tight end scored an 80-yard touchdown, his third of the day. This was finally the play that broke the game open. 
and Joe Namath seemed to realize it as he happily returned to the bench to congratulate Rich Castor. When you Even though there were five minutes left in the game, the Colts again trailed by 10. They were finished, and John Unitas must have known it as he wearily trudged on the field for another try. It was in vain. As his teammates watched, the Jets' containing defense allowed bits and pieces of yardage, but brought the Baltimore offense up short when it counted. The clock ran out to give New York its first regular season win ever over the Baltimore Colts. Of course, in 1969, the Jets won the big one. The man most responsible for that great victory had just as much reason to smile for this one. For Joe Namath had pierced Baltimore's vaunted zone defense for the incredible total of 496 yards and six touchdown passes. Both he and Unitas had combined for 822 yards through the air, over one half mile. More importantly, New York is now 2-0, the Colts 0-2, and the pressure is really on for them to make the playoffs. For the Jets, however, the prospects are excellent. For as long as Broadway Joe Namath remains healthy, even the Colt fans would agree.